Hump is a very beautiful place to fly. The most beautiful terrain, white mountains, and the sun snow on it, deep valleys in over Burma. In the early days, it was just like a adventure, something you like to do. They called it the Hump. People were getting killed, the weather was bad, this bad. There are frightening stories that would come forth. They called it the Umar Trails because on your way east there, against the morning sunlight, you could see the glitter of aluminum as we headed into the sun. These are from the aircraft that crashed on the hump. I was born in Baisan, west of Macau. My father took me to the United States in 1924 when I was nine. My uncle was in Shanghai, and he said that Pan America had fought over 45% of Sinai, and they made one of the high people there. In 1936, when I was checked out, I was not 23 years old. Yet. I was born in India and raised there until I was 14 and came to America. So I joined Pan American and I wound up in West Africa. I'd heard about CNAC. So one time I went to Calcutta, signed up, and that's how I joined CNAC the 1st of December of 1942. In uh, 1940, I inquired at the Canadian Air Force recruitment station, but they said they do not train any Oriental as pilots. So I said, okay, I'm going to go down to the States, Los Angeles, learn how to fly. I wrote to Pan American Airways, and China National wrote me right back. They said, come immediately, we can use you. So that's how I wound up in China in 1944. I was with the Pan American uh, Airways system, and then this opportunity for great adventure in the, in the Orient came up and uh, we went to China and arrived there in December of 1943. It turned out to me that this group of about 20 odd pilots were really the nucleus of our CNAC operation to start with. They came in there and before long they were flying the hump. Burma was falling and they want to find a new route, you know, a shipment by sea to Karachi and by rail to Praswa, Northwest Frontier. And then the place that we four countries, India, China, Pakistan, and Russia. The CNAC was already doing it when the U.S. Army said it was impossible for it to be done. Though we were civilians, we came under the umbrella of the China Burma India Theater of War. All our cargo was military by the CBI, and our gasoline for our aeroplanes by the CBI. My first flight across the hump, the load of passengers, and we're going to Chongqing. I didn't heard of it, but never knew where it was. I was on a scheduled flight, you know, carrying passengers from Calcutta, Xinjiang, Kunming, and Chongqing. And usually I, I got the charter flight. When I first arrived in India in 1944, the monsoons were on. And I said, how does a person breathe here? The sky was overcast and I had a hard time breathing. Hot and muggy. I saw a little thing like a postage stamp, and I said, Captain, is, is that the airport? He said, that's it. And I said, oh my God. And he went in there and landed this thing on the cobblestones. San Hupa Airport, the island in the middle of the Yangtze River. But the letdown into Chongqing was a hair-raising experience, and I wonder what I was doing. I might make more than a hundred landings into that, that little airport. When the Pearl Harbor came, he didn't have any airplane, and he didn't have any crew. Anyway, what plane they have, they have no one to fly them, and then use a CNAC plane. Well, he's very nice to me because he didn't have any other armor power than something myself. <laughs> we had a lot of chance that I, I never dreamed of going to. The president, he wanted to go up westward to Seattle and up to Lake Coconut, which is over 10,000 feet elevation and he wanted to see that lake. The 
captains were Americans, usually. Some, there were a lot of them of Chinese descent because they owed it something to the heritage that they were to go back and defend the country. Quite a few of them were pilots for CNAC, an excellent pilots. And, uh, but they were all from China heritage, but educated and trained in America. I don't think at one time there was more than a dozen Chinese uh, captains alive. We had a few co-pilots. They could speak anywhere from four to seven different languages, which no matter where we go, we'd have some interpreting. In the beginning, they didn't think much of a Chinese pilot, but during the war, they you see more and more Chinese. Then you have a lot of VIP from Washington come to church, and then they found out that the Chinese pilots ferried them around before they go to America. I was the first flight over the western part of the home, and they found out that the U.S. Air Force couldn't do it, and we did it, you see, so, so they got more confident in, in the Chinese. I left Calcutta at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I landed there, and they said, you're to fly with your brother. So uh, he said, you fly. I said, then why don't you fly first? Because I said, I've never flown a big plane like this. I've done three landings, and in the middle of the night, and I said, how can you tell where you are? He said, oh, wait another thought. And about 20 minutes, and I said, what was that? Oh, that's the uh, range of mountain over the Salween River there. We always get a downdraft on the east side of the mountain. The wind blowing over the hill there, you get a downdraft. So that tells us where we are. I said, where are we? He said, oh, we should see a lake pretty soon. That's Dali. There was a natural enemy because no place in the world does is the meteorological conditions so adverse to flying. The Tibetan cold air coming in on top of it caused a tremendous turbulence round and round and the highest updrafts in the world. It was unheard of. What I told people back in Canada that we flew through thunder ahead, rainstorm, hail, ice, the instrument take off. We talked each other onto the runway. It was an unarmed airplane, so therefore we had no way to shoot back, but we had to be very careful and fly low to avoid the Japanese fighters. Another sure way was to fly at night that time because the Japanese had no night fighters. About 1,500 transports that crashed on the hump, and that was the same rate as the fighters and the bombers, so flying transports was a dangerous thing. And China National was the only aircraft, the only airline, that flew the same route as the fighters and the bombers. This DC two and a half airplane was flying up around near Chengdu and, and uh, Chongqing. So when he landed there, people just got out of the aircraft and hid in the bamboo grove when the Japanese bombers came by and strafed and bombed this machine. One bomb landed on the right wing and blew it right off. So an airplane in those days was worth more than its weight in gold. It used some shortcuts. So many of the parts of DC-2, although smaller, could be transferred over this DC-3 wing. Well, that's the first DC-2 and a half that they did. Four of us were coming back from Kunming. One guy said, I know it's sort of like a shortcut. <laughs> You don't have to go over 10,000 feet. He said, if you follow me, I know this route. So we were on our way. We were coming up on the Salween River. And I could see Hayes' problems up ahead, but I decided to go down the mountain. And I saw his left wing hit the trees, and it was gone. Every few months, uh, we can look forward to a few paths being lost. You wondered why, you know. But after you've been there for a while, you knew why. It could be your turn next. But when two little bomb Japan, they took off from the aircraft carrier, landed in the dark, and uh, Dulo landed south of uh, Hangzhou, and then he went to Chongqing. I picked him up 
and took him to Mitchell in Burma, and Burma was falling. I did not know that we saw all the refugees were going away from the airfield towards town. Then when they, they heard our airplane, then they all rushed back to the airfield. And they were trying to get on the airplane, and we couldn't do anything to keep them away from the plane. And then we had a total of over 75 people on the first 21 passenger plane. And then Jimmy Dillow would ask me, he said, do you, do you know what you are doing? Uh, he didn't say, do, uh, what, he said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I said, oh, they don't weigh very much. Dude. And then when we got to Calcutta, not only the cabin was full, the back of the compartment, the, the door that goes in the back of the compartment, after we closed the cabin door, some people climbed up in the back of the compartment. Yunnan Yi, we turned north uh, to uh, go up to the Yangtze River. And there along the road, the, the people were so poor that uh, their clothes were threadbare. So it's quite a shock for me to hit these conditions out over the Himalayas in there. I think CNAC deserves a lot of credit. Uh, regardless of what people might think about them, civilians or mercenaries or anything else, they did a, a terrific job. We were there when we were needed the most. Before, nobody was interested. But I don't know how come all of a sudden this uh, last uh, five, six years people are interested in what happened six or five years ago. I think uh, most people coming back from the wars, it was nothing to glamorize. Uh, they wanted to protect their children from the horrors and the bestiality of the war. For this generation, despite that um, most of us in Asia or in China are aware of, that there was a Second World War, but they didn't know what the sacrifice uh, a lot of the people has to pay in order to uh, create peace for our generation. And I feel that the Hun pilots and their endeavor epitomized that particular effort. And when you tell us there's a band of, of flyers over there, that like no other in the world, it's just like science fiction rather than honest to goodness fact. We didn't know they had to fly in such difficult, unheard of conditions, eh? So that is why all of us in our old age, we try to present this to the people so that they know that it was no joke. At the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondent Club, we have an event that we try to let the story be told to a larger group of uh, journalists. And I was caught by surprise at how great the response has been that the whole evening was sold out. In saying that, did you have any procedures at all for the loss of the nation? Were there any options for it? The main decision was to try and dump the cargo. But I swore I'd never jump out of an airplane unless it was catching fire. The reason I say this is that Wall Street found out that some of the parachutes, the people of ground staff were stealing the silk and filling them from newspapers. And I thought it would be a hell of a situation to find myself perfect to 120 miles an hour from Europe reading the Gun News. One more? Okay, let me throw Hey, welcome back. Thank you. Pleasure to see you. Canadian, okay. <laughs> Spring chicken. Spring chicken, huh? <laughs> now, the, uh, I'm donating this to you. Wow. This is my tenth of two months. Fifty-seven years, his first trip coming back. That was one of the last planes we started evacuating Shanghai. I'm so happy to be here and to meet all the wonderful people. Uh, we have a big program that we'll leave tomorrow and two or three over to China. Modern Kunming? I love it! The only thing I don't recognize any place 
Pete hadn't found his old girlfriend yet. It looks something like the mountain of Gibraltar. But we called it Scarface Mountain. And we always used to come in, we knew we were right on track to land at the airport here. This place is closed in, and they had to circle a letdown. There was a lot of, lot of stuff left here after World War II. Try and you, Nanny. That looks like a Japanese one. That looks like a Japanese airplane to me. Sid was right. He says the box got there, Frank. Oh, yeah, decoy. That's the word. I see they save all the rollers. <laughs> oh, yeah. What, was, what were they doing? How did they do it? Did they, they use that buffalo? Or they used they Ooh, used manpower. Uh, 200 buffalo. Two-legged ones. Two-legged ones. Okay, so you stay. Men, women, yes, children, children, all get up there. All the oh, oh, gosh. Yeah. The kids, too. Why not? This has been finished only less than two years. Oh, really? Yeah, 205. That's Local Evans. Oh, are you in here? Yes. Yeah. All right, let's see. What's the set? Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'm glad to have this for them to remember. I'd like to come back and relive every place I've been when you get to be 90 years old, you know. meters and onward upward so so I, if we don't need to evacuate anyone let's stick to that plan. I'm feeling just fine uh, I'll let you know if anything develops. When the animals are on the ground, usually they hear the plane, they just look at it, but you have once or two you have the buses that chase them away with the sound. So 
first summer when we flew over there, we ever sent, saw the Yangtze River. Here's the There's a picture of that mountain back there. Amazing. What do you call this anyway? It's a computer. It's a computer. It's a computer because it computes what you're going to be doing. Please, let's get this thing on. CNAC was the Middle Kingdom Space Machine Company, and the letter they had on the vertical surface near the tailplane uh, was postal. Post office. And then underneath the wings they had in broad letters uh, C N A C and also that in Chinese letters, Middle Kingdom Space Machine. Just grand to be able to see this once. You just got to take some while to absorb it all. To reminisce 65 years ago. Here I am, standing, looking at the scenes of our youthful memories. I would never have a dream of coming here, I think. I dreamed of it, but I never thought I'd ever make it. 